thanks, Laszlo. So I'll just carry on when you finished your introduction. Okay, okay. So it's a great pleasure uh, to have Dr. Wayne Grayson, a consultant, he's a pathologist and dermatopathologist, UMPMAT uh, National Laboratory is Johannesburg, an honorary professor of the School of Pathology University of Witwatersrand, Johannesburg, uh, from South Africa to present for us. Uh, this is actually the first talk from uh, the African continent, and we are extremely proud that we were able to accomplish that, and we are extremely grateful for Dr. Grayson to come, and it is 9 o'clock his time to dedicate uh, time for his talk. Uh, Dr. Grayson obtained his undergraduate medical degree from the University of Free State, and he received his specialist training in anatomical pathology at the University of Witwater Strand, Johannesburg, and the South African Institute of Medical Research. In 2011, he was awarded a PhD from the University of Witwaterstrand and was later promoted to Principal Pathologist and Associate, Pro Associate Professor. He headed the Dermatopathology Service in the Division of Anatomical Pathology at the University of Witwaterstrand and the National Health Laboratory Service until 2008, when he joined Empath National Laboratories in Johannesburg as a consultant dermatopathologist. He is currently an honorary professor at the School of Pathology at the University of Witwaterstrand and remains actively involved in postgraduate training. Uh, Dr. Grayson serves on the editorial board of the American Journal of Dermatopathology, and his main interest is uh, infectious disease related to HIV and AIDS, and he is an expert of that. Is going to talk about this topic, and we are very uh, interested, and we would like to hear uh, about uh, his opinions and what he thinks is important uh, in the field of HIV and AIDS. So again, uh, thank you very much for coming on the program. On a personal note, uh, uh, Dr. Grayson is an extremely uh, nice person, probably the nicest uh, human being on, on planet Earth, with a great sense of humor. So it is an, a, a great companion uh, to uh, meet him anywhere, you know, when we are traveling around the world. So it's always a, a great pleasure to, uh, to have him nearby. Thank you so much uh, for coming on the program today. Thank you so much, Lazda, for those very kind words of introduction. And um, hello to all of you all over the world. Um, and greetings from Johannesburg, where it's uh, 9 p.m. And uh, just on a personal note, um, I've met people of Laszlo's caliber and at, just through my interaction with the International Society of Dermatopathology, which must be one of the loveliest organizations on this earth. So I would really encourage uh, any of you who are not members to join because it just is a wonderful organization of like-minded people who are all passionate about what they do and love to share their interesting material with others. And um, I have to commend Laszlo for what he's done in disseminating information worldwide. And I, I must say he's, he's, he's asked me to do this talk in the past and I'm a bit of a, a cyber luddite and I'm very apprehensive of information technology, but he's guided me through the process. So God willing, this will all be smooth sailing this, this evening. And uh, really what I want to share with you is some of the lessons I've learned in dealing with skin biopsy material from HIV AIDS. And rather than go through individual disease categories as they are listed in a textbook, I've tried to approach it from the angle of um, difficulties that one encounters when dealing with this material, pitfalls, and it's more economical for you to learn from, to learn from my mistakes than to make them your, yourself. So, um, South Africa has a population of just over 57 million people. It counts for about 0.75% of the total population of the planet. And it's the 24th most populous country in the world. So here we are at the, the South Africa's here. And um, just to give you some idea of the problem we have with HIV AIDS, this, these, these, this map indicates data from 2012, but the red areas just indicate the areas of the highest prevalence of HIV in, the, in, in parts of our country. And all these red areas, 16 to 22% of the population in these, these areas here. Now, Johannesburg is in Gauteng province, which is the smallest province, um, but we certainly have a problem here with HIV too. So if you practice in a country like South Africa, 
you have to be au fait with HIV AIDS, all aspects of it, not necessarily the skin manifestations of AIDS, but just HIV AIDS medicine in general, be it in private practice or in, in the public sector. And that's an aerial view of Greater Johannesburg, um, which has a population of around four and a half million, and it's about 5,751 feet um, above sea level. It's a great place. It has a bad reputation, but I've lived here my whole life, and uh, I just love Johannesburg. Um, and I really love the pathology that we see, uh, and that's a very good reason why I've chosen never to leave here. Um, just some, uh, that's our medical school where I did my postgraduate training. Probably the ugliest building in Johannesburg, but has a great view of the city, and that's the city center. And that's the city at, at uh, sunset. And this is the university uh, main campus, which is some distance from the medical school. And then any, and any of you who follow um, um, football will know that this is the stadium where the World Cup was hosted in, in 2010 in South Africa. Anyway, back to the problem of HIV and AIDS. Um, data from 2016 indicated that some 36.7 million people were infected with, with or had HIV AIDS and it accounts for about 0.8% of all adults worldwide. And if you look at the age here, these are economically productive people and that's why it has such a devastating impact. There were about almost 2 million new infections in 2016, a million deaths in 2016 and uh, about 35 million people have died since the beginning of the pandemic. So it really is a catastrophe. And the biggest catastrophe, unfortunately, is sub-Saharan Africa. This is the global epicenter of the pandemic. And Africa really has the hugest HIV problem. If you look at Eastern and Southern Africa, 19.4 million people with this disease. 43% um, of the total number of new infections worldwide occur in this part of the world. And even more staggering, almost 60% of the cases are in, in, in women and girls. So um, women and girls really do suffer from this disease. In Western Central Africa, it's about 6.1 million people living with the disease. And they're very similar data when it comes to the proportion of, of uh, female patients affected by HIV AIDS. Um, so it's estimated about 6.4 million or 12.2% of the world's population are HIV positive. So any disease that has that kind of prevalence, one has to be au fait with it. Um, and it's probably 1.2 million more than we had back in 2008. So the, the situation hasn't totally reversed itself, even although people are um, on antiretroviral therapy. Now, why is it important to be aware of the dermatological manifestations of HIV AIDS? Well, the most important aspect is that the skin disease is often the first presenting of HIV infection, often undiagnosed HIV infection. And what's telling is that nine out of 10 patients, perhaps even more, will develop skin disease during the course of their illness. So anyone dealing with, in, in an environment with, where dermatologists are seeing HIV AIDS patients must be au fait with the manifestations of this disease in the skin. Now, if you look at broad categories of disease in HIV AIDS, in the skin. Firstly, we have non-infective dermatoses, obviously the infectious conditions. One has to be aware of adverse drug reactions, including antiretroviral therapy and obviously neoplasia. Now, I'm not going to go through each of these categories in a didactic manner because that you could really find in any good textbook. But what I want to rather do is, is, is focus on the problem areas and the lessons that one I've learned myself and hope to share with you. Now, as with any um, aspect of, of dermatopathology, clinical pathological correlation is, is utterly essential and particularly so in the context of HIV AIDS. So what things do you need to know from, from your clinical colleagues when they're submitting biopsy materials? Well, what is the patient's CD4 count? Is he or she on antiretroviral therapy or are they ART naive? In our part of the world, some people are on HIV uh, antiretroviral therapy, but others present with full-blown AIDS. So we have to be aware of these aspects. Um, if they are on antiretroviral therapy, has their medication changed? Because this could have an impact on whether or not they perhaps have an adverse drug reaction. And the other question that we have to ask once patients are known to be on antiretroviral therapy is that when they do present with, with certain skin lesions, we have to ask the question, could this be a manifestation of the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome? And their clinical pathological correlation is, a, is, is very, very important in making the diagnosis. So these are some of the questions you need to to ask when dealing with uh, a biopsy from a patient with HIV AIDS. So um, 
the general approach to the, the, um, the HIV positive biopsy is to correlate the histopathological pattern with the clinical data. So just as any other aspect of skin pathology, what is the main pattern that you're seeing down the microscope? Correlate that with the, the clinical data and make a diagnosis. But I'm going to place specific, specific emphasis on lessons that I've learned, and then I want to highlight um, the diagnosis diagnostic pitfalls as we go along. So lesson number one, very simple lesson, know when to suspect HIV infection. So what aspects of the clinical history should alert you to that? Well, obviously, if a patient presents with an AIDS-defining condition like Kaposi sarcoma, for example, and th that would be AIDS-defining. But if you don't know the patient's retroviral status, what things would make a dermatologist here, um, or even a pathologist, concerned that there may be undiagnosed underlying HIV. Well, firstly, unusual or atypical clinical features. If a known condition pursues an abnormal course, that's always disconcerting. If a disease has greater severity than you'd anticipate for it, that's also, and then of course, failure to respond to standard therapy. So those are aspects that suggest that there may be some aspect of immunocompromise in, in the patient. The second lesson, and a very important one, is to remember that vastly different conditions can have very similar clinical features. And I, I, I've, uh, I've shown these slides at many meetings just to emphasize a point. Now, if you look at those three images, I think you, I could forgive you for assuming that they were all taken from the same patient, but they're in fact from three different patients with very different diseases. That patient has molluscum contagiosum and giant lesions of molluscum. This patient has bacillary angiomatosis, and this lady has cutaneous cryptococcosis. So that emphasizes why it is so important to biopsy these lesions and not just presume that something is molluscum when it's in fact bacillary angiomatosis or cryptococcosis. That could have a devastating impact on the patient's outcome. So skin biopsy is a very, very important tool in managing these patients. Um, just some other cases to illustrate you. These, these are, I'm going to show you a series of images of patients with pruritic papular skin lesions. They all look identical, itchy papules in HIV positive patients. That man, the lady next door, and this other patient. Identical lesions clinically, but on biopsy, the gentleman actually has early suppurative folliculitis, which is sometimes very itchy in AIDS and doesn't look obviously pustular on clinical examination, but there you can clearly see on the biopsy ruptured um, suppurative folliculitis. This patient has uh, on biopsy an intensely um, dense uh, folliculocentric infiltrate of eosinophilic leukocytes expanding that follicle, and she has HIV-associated eosinophilic folliculitis. And this patient on biopsy, you can see, has an excoriated lesion here. And in her biopsy, there's an infiltrate of eosinophils in the interstitium and in the perivascular compartment. Um, but notably, on bi in, in this view of this pilosebaceous unit, you can see there's a conspicuous absence of a folliculocentric infiltrate of eosinophilic leukocytes. So she doesn't have HIV-associated eosinophilic folliculitis, but in fact has HIV-associated papulopruritic eruption. So the diseases look similar clinically, but they're different down the microscope. The other lesson, or lesson number three, that I'd like to share with you is that a given condition can have a diverse array of potential cutaneous manifestations. And one example that comes to mind is histoplasmosis. These are three different patients with HIV-associated histoplasmosis. But look how different the lesions are. They can even they can be crusted. They can even resemble vasculitic lesions. And just to highlight the extent of the potential cutaneous manifestations of histoplasmosis, look at this list here. Histoplasma capsulatum infection in AIDS can look like any of these conditions, right down to vasculitis. Syphilis is another, uh, another uh, uh, disease that can have vastly different cutaneous manifestations. Here we see th three different patients with syphilis and the different skin lesions that can be encountered in that context. We also tend to see in HIV these rupial or oyster shell-like lesions of syphilis which are very dramatic. And then of course Louis Maligna which is a particularly unpleasant form of secondary syphilis in HIV. So the whole um, um, spectrum from primary to secondary to tertiary syphilis is, is telescoped and accelerated in patients with underlying HIV AIDS. So if you diagnose syphilis in a country like ours, you have to obviously check that the patient um, isn't HIV positive. So the basic diagnostic approach 
requires recognition of a dominant reaction pattern, interpret that pattern in the context of the clinical history, and then the dermatological finding. And if you put that all together, I think in 99% of cases, you'll be able to make an accurate diagnosis. And I think this lesson here probably applies to every aspect of skin pathology on a daily basis, regardless of whether or not it's HIV, AIDS associated. That's a rule. Recognize the pattern and interpret it in in the context of the clinical history and the dermatological findings and the dermatological differential diagnosis. And I think that recognition of that dominant pattern is, is a very useful one, um, particularly if you don't see much of this material. But if you, if you recognize the dominant pattern, um, you're well on your way to making a correct diagnosis and then interpret it in the context of the history and the findings on dermatological examination. So these are the main patterns that one sees in, in HIV material and I like to try and slot it into one of these. Sometimes diseases don't fit perfectly into these categories but if you but generally they do and uh, if you go through this list and you can slot it into one of these you can generally narrow down the differential diagnosis um, quite quite well. Uh, I'm going to come back to this aspect later. Biopsies that look normal I would a great I'd, I'd, one should exercise a great caution in diagnosing something as being histologically normal because no dermatologist is going to biopsy fresh air. There must be something there and there's certain diseases that can look normal or near normal on, on cursory examination. So that's a potential pitfall. And the other pitfall that I'm going to highlight later and one that can easily catch one out is um, when patients have more than one pathology in a given biopsy and that's a particularly hazardous um, aspect of HIV AIDS pathology and, and very easy to miss more than one uh, pathology. So I'm going to come back to that near the end. Um, I wrote a, a review article in the Journal of um, Clinical Pathology some 10 years ago. Um, I think what I said in that paper is still pretty relevant and um, it deals with an approach to the HIV um, skin biopsy and I could suggest that you perhaps look at that because I'm not going to go through this talk in the way that I did in, the, the, um, in that review article. I'm just going to rather highlight um, points of concern and, and lessons that I've learned and you can consult this um, um, review article if you wish to. Um, lesson number five um, and an important lesson is to remember that certain diseases can present with atypical clinical features and or atypical histopathology in patients with HIV AIDS. For example, psoriasiform seborrheic dermatitis can, is the commonest um, skin manifestation of HIV AIDS and um, you can see it's a really extreme example here and one useful feature in addition to the uh, psoriasiform hyperplasia of the epidermis is that one sometimes sees these apoptotic keratinocytes in the epidermis. So if we hear that a biopsy is from a patient with a very severe seborrheic dermatitis and on histology see these cells that automatically alerts one that we might be dealing with with underlying HIV. Psoriasis um, as far as far as I'm aware, the incidence of psoriasis is not increased in HIV AIDS, but the disease can certainly pursue an atypical course or be more dramatic, as you see in this particular case of a very severe psoriasis in a patient with AIDS. Um, sporotrichosis is another one. Um, patients can have disseminated cutaneous lesions um, if they acquire sporothric shenkii in, in the AIDS. And the other thing to remember is that Unlike conventional sporotrichosis, where one sees the typical asteroid bodies where the yeasts are surrounded by splendori hoopli phenomenon, um, in, in the context of HIV AIDS, one often does not see that. And uh, you just see these very small fungal organisms in neutrophilic microapsis contained within granulomas. So that's another aspect. So the histology can differ as well in, in HIV AIDS. Another disease that can have unusual histology is something like herpes zoster. Patients with HIV AIDS uh, can develop these hyperkeratotic lesions. And if you look at this biopsy, there's extreme hyperkeratosis, but if we focus on this portion of the specimen, there's clear varicella zoster virus infection, and the patient had more typical herpes zoster lesions elsewhere. Another disease that can have an abnormal presentation in HIV AIDS is scabies, and this extreme crusted or Norwegian form is seen, and it's not that uncommon, um, a very unpleasant condition for the uh, unfortunate patient and uh, it certainly has a strong association with immune compromise including um, HIV AIDS. Patients with um, HIV AIDS can also develop very large giant lesions of molluscum contagiosum. 
I think this is probably the most extreme example I've ever seen um, and extremely disfiguring uh, to the patient. But the histology is still the same as molluscum, but it does emphasize how important it is to do the biopsy. I'm not sure that you'd have made that diagnosis clinically uh, in a case like this. The other important lesson to remember is that a adverse drug reaction should always be on one's radar screen. Um, here we see a patient who developed a mobiliform drug erup eruption after initiation of antiretroviral therapy and useful features, I think it's true for any adverse drug reaction really, is a combination of histological reaction patterns, the subtle lymphocytic vasculopathic reaction with some interface dermatitis and some spongiotic change and these dyskeratotic keratinocytes with a history of having initiated antiretroviral therapy would lead one to the correct diagnosis. To stay. Um, here we see a patient with Stevens-Johnson syndrome which was ascribed to nevirapine with the typical uh, histology uh, there. This patient developed a lycanoid drug eruption after um, initiating anti-tuberculous therapy. They had, um, he had tuberculosis as a complication of his AIDS and then on initiation of the therapy developed an, a lycanoid drug eruption. So, although a lichenoid reaction or interface dermatitis often points towards an adverse drug reaction, it's not always the case. So, that's another lesson I think one should bear in mind. For example, here we see an, a case of herpes-associated erythema multiforme, where the patient who had AIDS and extensive ulceration of the genitalia because of herpes and then subsequently developed erythema multiforme. Um, here we see secondary syphilis. Um, with a combination of hyperplasia of the epidermis, interface change, and the dermal plasma cytosis. And if you're very fortunate, this Worth and Starry stain will highlight the spirochetes, but fortunately one has immunistic chemistry uh, to confirm that. Another lesson that I've learned is that although suppurative granulomas uh, are often a, an indication of a deep fungal infection or a mycobacterial infection, this isn't always the case. And I've been caught out like this before. For example, if you look at this, this um, punch biopsy, there's a suppurative granuloma here in the dermis, the neutrophils uh, and the surrounding palisade of histiocytes. Uh, another example here, a, a much larger area of granulomas is inflammation and central suppuration. And, and it's easy to mistake that as some sort of deep fungal infection or perhaps an atypical mycobacterial infection. But just look at these important clues here. You can see on examination of additional serial sections, it's intimately associated with a pilosebaceous follicle. There's a hair shaft. So this is actually a folliculocentric process. This suppurative inflammation has expanded the hair follicle and ruptured, and that's what's inside of the granulomatous response. And this man presented with furunculosis. He was not known to have HIV, but because of his extreme furunculosis, he was tested and found to have AIDS. So this is a pitfall. And it emphasizes how important it is to do additional serial sections. And that brings me to this lesson. Multiple serial sections, critical for accurate diagnosis, particularly if the pathology is folliculocentric. If you don't cut a sufficient number of sections to get near the center of the punch biopsy where the follicle is, uh, you're going to miss the follicle and go down a completely wrong diagnostic tree and think about an invasive fungal infection or uh, an atypical mycobacterial infection or perhaps even tuberculosis when all along it was just a plain old bacterial furunculosis. Similar situation with um, pterosporum folliculitis. Here again, um, a ruptured intradermal uh, uh, follicle with the malassezia yeast and suppurative inflammation. In patients with HIV AIDS, it's, it's important to always perform a panel of relevant special stains to rule out an unsuspected opportunistic infection. And if you don't do this, it's so easy to miss something and that can have devastating um, an impact on the patient. Uh, for example, just to illustrate that point, I think you'll agree that on, on inspection of this biopsy, one's knee-jerk reaction is to say, wow, that's probably a leukocytoclastic vasculitis. Um, there's karyorectic debris. Are these histiocytes mopping up the debris? Yes, there are black dots here that are, are perhaps karyorectic debris. But can you see there are also some more you know, cynophilic or amphiphilic dots in the background? It's actually histoplasmosis. And this is one of the conditions that can look very much like vasculitis clinically and histologically. If you don't do the stains, you're going to miss the organisms. And they're very easy to miss, particularly in, when patients are very severely immunocompromised and they don't mount any host response to the organisms here. You can see them in the 
dermis with very little of a host response are noted. So it's very important to do special stains. Another case, a very gravely ill man with multiple um, skin lesions all over his body, mostly these small coalescent dark papules. Now on biopsy, um, I think any histopathologist will look at that pattern and think, wow, that looks like dermatitis epitiformis. It's from this patient, but believe it or not, he has disseminated cutaneous tuberculosis. No evidence of a granulomatous reaction whatsoever. In fact, it's neutrophilic. But on special staining, teeming with acid fast mycobacterial bacilli, this man died of um, cryptococcal, uh, sorry, um, tuberculous meningitis. And most patients who have disseminated cutaneous tuberculosis are very, very gravely ill. So the, just because something isn't granulomatous does not mean it isn't mycobacterial. So it's important to do a panel of stains, such as periodic acid shift, Zeal Nielsen, and just make sure that you're not missing an infection that has an unusual reaction pattern that um, brought about by the underlying HIV status. And as a pathologist, one also has a duty to indicate or recommend to one's clinical colleagues when additional samples should be referred for microbiological examination. Recommend biopsies for fungal culture, mycobacterial culture, PCR where necessary. Um, vasculitis in HIV AIDS has many potential causes and I guess that's a talk in its own. So I'm just going to highlight one or two points here. Um, what I find useful is direct, just identify the pattern. If the vasculitis looks lymphocytic, that could indicate that the patient has acute exanthem of HIV infection or um, as one potential, as a, as a manifestation of seroconversion. But a morbidiform drug eruption will also have a lymphocytic vasculopathic component. Leukocytoclastic vasculitis, on the other hand, has a great many etiologies in patients with HIV AIDS, including viruses such as HIV itself, but a host of other viruses from CMV to varicella zoster drugs. Certain antiretroviral agents can precipitate leukocytoclastic vasculitis. There's an increased association with henoch schonheim and purpura. As you know, erythema elevatum diutinum has leukocytoclastic vasculitis. In fact, EED has an association with HIV AIDS. So that's important to remember. Here we see a patient who presented with this rash and um, was found to be HIV positive. As, and this is HIV, acute HIV exanthem or seroconversion. Combination of features, again, this lymphocytic vasculopathic reaction with very subtle red cell extravasation the subtle interface change, some apoptotic keratinocytes, a little bit of spongiosis and parakeratosis. A mobility form drug eruption in HIV AIDS could look identical, but again, it's the clinical pathological context and the nature of the rash. Here we see a mobility form drug eruption brought about by heart with a similar combination of features. So that combination of features suggests a, a drug rash or perhaps seroconversion illness. Here we see an example of HIV-associated leukocytoclastic vasculitis with all the typical appearances of fibrinoid necrosis, fibrin extravasation, and uh, perivascular red cell extravasation. Papulonecrotic tubercular, just remember, also has a vasculitic component. If you're fortunate enough to see this section at the, in the correct, the correct level, the apex of the area of dermal involvement which is sometimes uh, manifest as necrosis, will show a vasculopathic reaction. And so there we see a vasculopathic reaction at the tip of a typical lesion of papillonecrotic tuberculin in a patient who was found to have HIV-associated tuberculosis on uh, further investigation. If the vasculitis shows, is palisading and shows neutrophilic and granulomatous, these are the conditions you should think of. There's an increased risk of Chirk, Strauss, Takayasu, and even polyarteritis nodosa. And if the vasculitis involves the subcutaneous vessels, you obviously have to think of PAN, and then of course nodular vasculitis or erythema injuratum as a manifestation of underlying tuberculosis. Here we see an example of HIV-associated um, polyarteritis nodosa with a typical histological appearance, and here an example of erythema injuratum in a patient with AIDS who had underlying pulmonary tuberculosis manifesting with um, paniculitic nodules on the calves with all the typical features, the caseous-like necrosis, the granulomatous inflammation, and these obvious vasculitic uh, lesions uh, in the subcutaneous compartment. 
Another important lesson to remember, and lesson number 13, is to remember that if you see a vascular proliferation in a patient with HIV AIDS, don't automatically assume that they have Kaposi sarcoma. And I'm going to take you through some of those uh, pitfalls. The one uh, disease that immediately comes to mind is Bacillariangiomatosis because there is a vasoproliferative process, but it's a combination of features, the multiple skin nodules, vascular proliferation, neutrophilic infiltrate with debris, and most importantly, these amphiphilic colonies of bacteria, which on Worth and Starry staining are found to be short bacillary organisms, and on electron microscopy, they have short bacilli with a very characteristic trilaminar uh, wall. But there are pitfalls in bacillary angiomatosis, and I want to highlight some of them. Firstly, lesions can look clinically identical to pyogenic granulomas. In fact, they can look almost identical to pyogenic granulomas at the histological level. I'm going to illustrate that shortly. Another great pitfall is if an involuting or resolving lesion is biopsied. I think it's almost impossible to make that diagnosis. Sometimes one sees kaposiform areas in the dermis adjacent to a more typical lesion of Bacillus angiomatosis, and there have been reports in the literature where the, where the infection is completely masked by florid pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. I've not been fortunate enough to see an example of that, of that uh, myself, but I will show you a, a photograph of that from the literature. This patient presented with multiple pyogenic granuloma-like lesions, and if they're small enough, the entire uh, lesion can be removed by means of a punch biopsy. And on, on cursory inspection, one sees a vascular proliferation, is a very typical epidermal choloretia. And with that clinical picture and that histology, why wouldn't one think of a pyogenic granuloma? However, uh, it's not quite right. It doesn't have a typical lobular configuration to the proliferation. And if you have a high index of suspicion and do the appropriate stains, you'll see it's a wash with a sea of um, Bartonella organisms. Resolving lesions, as I said before, are very problematic. If you look at the right-hand panel here, I don't think anyone could be expected to diagnose bacillary angiomatosis. This is from the same patient. At the periphery, there are pockets of neutrophils and very subtle aggregates of bacteria, perhaps. Um, I wasn't entirely convinced, but on PCR, it was found to have Bartonella DNA. The patient had AIDS, and it was only because of these residual areas here that re reminded one of more typical bacillary angiomatosis at the penny drop. But this panel, it just looks like any involuting vascular lesion, I guess. And I wouldn't have thought of an infectious process. Um, this is one report from the American Journal of Dermatopathology some years ago, where a patient had bacillary, had bacillary angiomatosis. But the pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia was so extreme that it completely obscured the underlying infection. So that's a really big pitfall. And you can imagine how difficult it would be to make this diagnosis if a shave biopsy were undertaken. Um, but I've not seen this myself in, in practice. Other um, pitfalls that can occur in bacillary angiomatosis is where there's co-infection with other pathogens. That's uncommon, but it certainly does occur. Uh, sorry, I mentioned uh, the Kaposi form areas in the adjacent dermis. And something else that we've seen is large tumoral lesions that can mimic a sarcoma. And I'm coming back to that point shortly. Um, this specimen here was from a 26-year-old lady's forearm, and the clinical diagnosis was an abscess. But on examination, it's clearly bacillary angiomatosis with the vascular proliferation. Note the very extreme endothelial swelling. They can look very plump and epithelioid. But the clue is these pockets of neutrophils and these amphiphilic colonies of bacteria. But on careful inspection of the section, something else caught one's eye. And if you look at that cell, there's clearly evidence of concomitant cytomegalovirus infection in addition to the bacillary angiomatosis. What we have seen from time to time is that patients sometimes present with one or more, and often just solitary, large tumorous masses, such as this lady on the, on the thumb. This is another case. I saw it was a referral case from an, a Lesotho, which is a neighboring landlocked country. They have a very high number of HIV AIDS cases in that country. And I was fortunate enough to see this case. And it arrived one Saturday morning, and I was absolutely convinced we were dealing with a sarcoma. It was a five, six centimeter tumor with a very fleshy cut surface, which was extensively ulcerated. And I looked at the sections on Monday morning and realized that it was not a sarcoma. It was actually an enormous tumor-like mass 
because of bacillary angiomatosis. And he has the histology, the vascular proliferation, the neutrophils, and many, many colonies of amphiphilic bacteria, which stained with uh, Worth and Story. What about multiple pyogenic granulomas in HIV? Well, I think it's very, very important to remember that diagnosing multiple pyogenic granulomas in HIV AIDS is probably a rather dangerous thing to do. Initially, multiple pyogenic granulomas were reported in association with a protease inhibitor uh, in Dinova. Uh, it has also been reported in other antiretroviral agents. They typically occur on the, the toes with associated paronychia, and they can even occur in children. So diagnosing multiple pyogenic granulomas is fine in this context. But to the best of my knowledge, there are no reports of true eruptive pyogenic granulomas in HIV AIDS. But here's some examples to show you the, these paronychia and these pyogenic granulomas in the nail folds in patients on antiretroviral therapy. Other examples where the histology looks fairly much like a lobular capillary hemangioma. Um, so the, the, the warning that I wanted just to go back to that last lesson is if you are tempted to diagnose multiple eruptive pyogenic granulomas in a patient with AIDS, I think be extremely careful. In my experience, mo those are usually bacillary angiomatosis. And the image I showed you of um, that pyogenic granuloma-like lesion in that gentleman on the face illustrates that point. That uh, patient actually had hepatic and splenic pileosis and died from his disease, even though his lesions look, skin lesions look so pyogenic granuloma-like. Another lesson that I've learned is that there, there's a, one has a, have an increased awareness of a broader spectrum of Kaposi sarcoma, and this has emerged in recent years. And there are a whole number of clinical and histological variants which come to mind. And the one that one sees from time to time is this variant. I think of the variants of Kaposi sarcoma, this is the one we see probably see most often. It's the lymphangioma-like variant. Now, if you're not aware of it, it's very easy to diagnose this as a, some sort of lymphatic tumor, but this is is in fact lymphangioma-like Kaposi sarcoma, with these great lymphangioma-like spaces. This is another example with these ectatic spaces containing frothy fluid, which looks absolutely like lymph. It's marks with a lymphatic marker, you have podoplanin, but if you look at the HIV immunostain, it's clearly uh, an HHV-related um, process, and it's in fact lymphangioma-like Kaposi sarcoma. Another variant that can catch out is, is anaplastic or pleomorphic Kaposi sarcoma. Um, I have a very limited experience of this. I think it's very uncommon, but it can it, it catches one out very easily. Why? Because it doesn't look obviously vasoformative. This looks like a son, solid spindle cell proliferation. I don't see any erythrocytes in these slight spaces between the tumor cells. As you can see here, it's mitotically active, and the cells just a little, look a little more atypical than you see in conventional nodular Kaposi sarcoma. There's even a crosis in some uh, lesions, as we see here. Another variant that can that can cause problems is the verrucous type of Kaposi sarcoma. These verrucous skin lesions. Um, here we see a shave biopsy from such a case, and there's hyperkeratosis and acanthosis, and it is a shave biopsy. Fortunately, it's a deep shave biopsy and it's caught this diagnostic area here. But superficial shave biopsies in cases like this would lead to the diagnosis being overlooked. And because of background lymphedema, you might think that that's just uh, those changes in the epidermis are just related to chronic lymphedema. But the underlying cause is visible here on closer inspection. And that's this is all Kaposi sarcoma here in the dermis. Another lesion that can catch one out is the pyogenic granuloma-like variant of Kaposi sarcoma. Clinically, they look absolutely like pyogenic granulomas. Um, so there's another reason for um, for not diagnosing pyogenic granulomas in patients with HIV AIDS is this variant. And on biopsy, sometimes the entire nodule is removed. As you can see here, there's crusting and ulceration and an epidermal colorate around this vascular proliferation. The other lesson to remember is that not all spindle cell proliferations are due to Kaposi sarcoma. So although an intradermal spindle cell lesion is often a manifestation of nodular Kaposi sarcoma in particular, not all spindle cell proliferations are such as this case. This was a 14-year-old boy with a subcutaneous nodule over the scapular area. He was HIV positive. 
And you can see a spindle proliferation here. But if we look at the immunohistochemistry, it's in fact HHV8 negative, but shows staining with these three muscle markers. And uh, in situ hybridization show that it was an EBV uh, related condition. And so this is an Epstein-Barr virus associated smooth muscle tumor, which we do see occasionally in patients with AIDS. Another spindle proliferation that can catch one out is a multiple eruptive dermatofibromas. This was from a university student who presented with an eruption of multiple lesions on the skin. And on biopsy, there's this intradermal spindle proliferation. And as you can see here, there's an overlying reactive hyperplastic epidermis. And the periphery of the lesion showed all the typical features of a dermatofibroma with a checkerboard like merging with adjacent dermal collagen. And this this is sometimes a presenting feature of undiagnosed HIV AIDS. So if a patient presents with an eruption of dermatofibromas, beware. It could actually be a harbinger of under, underlying HIV AIDS. Something else that can catch one up very easily is a mycobacterial spindle cell pseudotumor. Um, here we see a solid intradermal spindle proliferation, but these spindle cells are in fact histiocytes. Um, but if you don't appreciate that they're histiocytes, it would mean that you'd not necessarily go to the next step and do an appropriate um, stain for acid-fast mycobacterial bacilli. And this biopsy was crawling with um, acid-fast bacilli, and that's a mycobacterial spindle cell pseudotumor. Bear in mind that um, mycobacteria are not the only cause of pseudotumors in, in HIV AIDS. Here we see an example of cryptococcus neoformans presenting as a spindle cell pseudotumor. So again, be very aware of this. And again, just to highlight one other point, or well, a point I made earlier, do special stains. They're inexpensive. Do a PAS or a mucicarmine stain and a Zeal Nielsen stain and make sure that you don't get caught out. Another lesson that I've learned is that um, not all atypical um, lymphoid infiltrates in patients with HIV AIDS are due to non-Hodgkin lymphoma. They often are. Here we see a patient who had an intra-abdominal um, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, um, it was HIV positive, and then the tumor recurred with vengeance and showed massive involvement of the anterior abdominal wall, and this patient demised from, and this is the biopsy from that patient, uh, recurrent diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Here we see a case of plasmablastic lymphoma. This patient died from the plasmablastic lymphoma, which was penile, he was in his 20s. Um, with a very typical histology, these neoplastic cells that look like immunoblasts, plasmablasts with positive staining for epithelial membrane antigen and, and um, markers of plasmacytic differentiation. So if you see an atypical lymphoid infiltrate in an HIV positive patient and it's dermal based and it consists predominantly of B cells, what are the options? It, of course, a B cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma, either primary cutaneous or disseminated disease with, with skin involvement. But just be aware, nodular secondary syphilis can look very pseudolymphomatous. And so can human, a herpes, herpes simplex virus infection. It can incite a very vigorous mononuclear in, inflammatory response. And so much so that one, it's very easy to, to not see the wood for the trees and miss the herpes simplex inclusions because one's so overwhelmed by the appearance of the dermal infiltrate. So that's a, definitely a potential pitfall. If you encounter an atypical uh, dermal lymphoid infiltrate and it's T-cell predominant, obviously you have to think of T-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma, be it primary or secondary, such as this case. This was an HIV-associated CD30 positive um, uh, T-cell lymphoma, confirmed histologically, as you can see there. The other thing to remember, though, is that not all CD30 positive infiltrates in the skin are lymphomatous, and you can certainly see very striking pseudolymphomatous reactions to molluscum contagiosum with CD30 expression, such as this case. Um, large atypical lymphoid cells expressing CD30, again, emphasizing how important it is to do sufficient number of serial sections. The case was sent to me as a consult because the referring pathologist uh, uh, was of the view that this was a CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorder. And only when I recut the case uh, and cut deeper into the block that I realized that we actually were dealing with molluscum contagiosum. So just be aware of that. If there's a T-cell lymphoid infiltrate and it demonstrates epidermotropism, of course one has to think of mycosis fungoides. Now having said that, MF is 
rather rare in HIV AIDS, but it does occur. This is one case that I've seen. This was a CD8 positive example. Um, as you can see, a very atypical epidermotropic lymphoid infiltrate with prominent CD8 expression. Um, but if one sees uh, something that looks like M MF histologically, one has to be aware of the differential diagnosis, particularly if the infiltrate expresses CD8, because there is this entity of HIV-associated CD8 positive epidermotropic infiltrate or atypical cutaneous lymphoproliferative disorder in HIV AIDS. Um, and there's, there's not really much literature on it. This was a, from a 1999 publication in the International Journal of Dermatopathology, just highlighting the diffuse um, spectrum of, of lesions that can occur. Erythematous papules and plaques in this patient, and here more hyperpigmented and hypopigmented and depigmented lesions and patches on that in that particular patient with an atypical cellular infiltrate demonstrating um, tropism for the overlying epidermis. But the cells can certainly look very atypical in cerebriform as we see here in this, this electron photomicrograph. I already alluded to this a short while ago, but I'd like to emphasize it again. Shave biopsies are often not adequate for diagnostic purposes, particularly when one is dealing with ulcerated lesions, ulcerated or verrucous tumors or deep-seated infections. And it's quite self-explanatory. If you're not getting to the meat of the matter, you're going to overlook the, the pathology and miss, and miss the diagnosis. So, for example, something like HIV-associated pyoderma uh, gangrenosum in this case. A superficial shave biopsy from a lesion like this is just going to show necrosis and exudate, and it's going, not really going to yield much in terms of a diagnosis. Similarly, if you have to do a superficial shave biopsy from this one of these ulcerated lesions here, you probably un, uh, um, not pick up the underlying cellular infiltrate, which was uh, a B-cell uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And similarly, ulcerated capricity sarcoma lesions, a superficial shave biopsy is just going to show exudate and very little of the underlying lesion. And the other problem with shave biopsy is that should you wish to do ancillary um, immunistic chemical investigations, um, it's very difficult to do so because of the paucity of cellular material. So you actually want enough material to do, to make a confident diagnosis and confirm your diagnosis, particularly when dealing with neoplastic proliferations. I alluded to, uh, to Verrucous uh, Kaposi sarcoma earlier on. Here we see a shave biopsy. Fortunately, this was thick enough to pick up the, the Kaposi sarcoma lesion down here. But some of the shave biopsies we received from our more conservative dermatologists are miserable superficial things that are roughly at this level here. And it stands to reason that all that one's going to see that one's going to see in a case like that is just some hyperplastic epidermis with hyperkeratosis, and the diagnostic area down here will easily be over, overlooked. Infections can also be a problem if you a superficial specimen like this example of cutaneous amebiasis. If we don't have enough of the underlying dermal exudate, it will be very easy to miss the trophozoites containing the uh, erythrocytes. Uh, another lesson um, that I really want to emphasize is that one must be very, very careful about, about biopsies that appear normal or near normal. Um, no dermatologist is going to send us a biopsy of clinically normal skin. So if they think there's something wrong, there is a very good reason for it. And um, I just want to show you some of the examples where biopsies can appear normal or near normal. Tinea corporis um, can have is one example. <clears throat> the biopsy can look frightfully unremarkable, but if you have a high enough index of suspicion, you'll do a PAS stain and confirm the fungal hyphenostratum corneum. So this is a list of um, some of the entities that can present with a normal or a near normal biopsy. So I alluded to a superficial fungal infection. Pitsyrhizus rubra pilaris has an association with underlying HIV AIDS. And I think all of us who've been doing dermatopathology for some time know that this can be a terribly difficult diagnosis. That distinctive geometric parakeratosis is very easy to overlook. Another condition that can, can also catch one out is this incomplete or interstitial form of granuloma annulare where there, there isn't well-formed necrobiosis, just a slightly hypercellular dermis what Whedon refers to as a busy dermis. And another cause of a busy dermis is very early patch stage capacity sarcoma. Very early lesions can, can look frightfully unremarkable. It's only when you have a high index of suspicion and look very 
carefully and realize that the dermis isn't entirely normal. It's just more cellular than it ought to be. And then the finally, patients who are profoundly immunosuppressed are unable to mount a, a satisfactory host inflammatory response to an infection. And their biopsies can look frightfully unremarkable, such as this example. Um, this low power photomicrograph looks terribly unimpressive, perhaps a little perivascular inflammation. But on careful inspection, you can see that it's busier than it ought to be. And there's a sea of organisms here and uh, very few histiocytes. And that patient actually has histoplasmosis. But a CD4 count of four and profoundly immunosuppressed and hence no, no host, re host response. Another lesson that I've learned that is that because certain infections are rare or uncommon, doesn't mean that you're never going to see them. So um, in our country, you, you just have to be very open-minded and learn to expect the unexpected. And I'll just show you some examples. This little one um, presented with um, enlargement of uh, or a mass in the axilla and a lesion on the arm, which broke down. As And this, the, the axillary lesion also broke down. And on biopsy, a sea of necrotic material, neutrophils, ghost outlines of histiocytes, and on Zeal Nielsen staining, absolutely packed with organisms, many of which were intracellular, and on culture, Mycobacterium bovis, and that's a reaction to BCG vaccination. So that's almost analogous to a GON complex of tuberculosis in, in the lung. So that's something one does see from time to time in HIV positive patients. This is a unique case I am shared with me by a colleague at another laboratory in Johannesburg. This was a 47 year old HIV positive man who presented with a polypoid mass in the external auditory canal. Um, pathologists who practice general pathology and also do pulmonary pathology from time to time. We'll look at this photomicrograph and there'll be an almost knee-jerk response to the diagnosis. But if you only deal with skin pathology, this infection will probably be the furthest thing from your mind. But that photomicrograph has a certain distinctive look about it, this frothy appearance with some inflammatory cells in the background. And in fact, those are fungal organisms. These cup-shaped organisms looking exactly as they do in lung biopsy material. And that's a case of cutaneous pneumocystosis or pneumocystis gerovecci infection. And for some unusual reason, when patients develop cutaneous uh, pneumocystosis or pneumocystis gerovecci infection in the context of, um, of HIV AIDS, they present with polypoid masses in the ear canal, which is just rather unusual, but they can occur elsewhere, for example, on glabrous skin. Another case, um, Unfortunately, I don't have clinical images of this particular patient. It was a, a, a postal case from a, a, a far off um, hospital. This patient was, was gravely ill with ileus, um, septicemia, and multiple hemorrhagic skin lesions on the anterior abdominal wall. And on closer inspection, I think you'll agree, there is an evidence of a vasculitic process. We can see red cell extravasation, fibrin extravasation, but something else catches your mind in the dermis. The dermis looks busy. And in addition to the vasculitis, we can clearly see that there are, in fact, larval larvae, parasitic larvae migrating through the skin. They're even in, inside a dermal um, vessel. And, and morphologically, those are clearly uh, larval forms of strongyloides stercoralis. So that's a case of disseminated strongyloidiasis in the skin. And it's a very, very serious infection in patients with AIDS and um, not unexpectedly, uh, this patient succumbed to his illness. They often die from sepsis. A very important lesson, in fact, it's a hobby of mine, but, um, is to always look for dual pathology or even multiple pathology. I think we as pathologists are inclined to, to pat ourselves on the back and congratulate ourselves when we make it a good diagnosis. But when you're dealing with HIV AIDS material, don't rest on your laurels. Just because you've made one diagnosis doesn't mean that a specimen doesn't harbor second pathology or even third pathology. Fortunately, it's uncommon, but if you don't have a high index suspicion, it's very easy to miss dual or multiple pathology. And, uh, and it's not unexpected that we see more than one pathological process in a given biopsy. For example, if you look at this patient, he clearly has two different types of skin lesions, these hyperpigmented patches and plaques, and these clearly elevated nodular lesions. Those lesions are Kaposi's sarcoma, 
he also had basurian geomatosis. And it's important to remember that morphologically different lesions ought to be biopsied. There's no point in submitting just one punch biopsy when a patient has such divergent clinical features. And in this case, he had a treatable bacterial infection which could have cost him his life if it wasn't diagnosed, in addition to Kaposi sarcoma. The typical scenario where we see dual pathology is this is a scenario like that. This patient not only had HIV AIDS, but he was an insulin dependent diabetic with this gross genital ulceration. And another patient, a female patient with vulval and perineal ulceration, who demonstrated the identical histological findings. Clear evidence of herpes simplex infection. But one thing that one always does in patients with um, genital um, herpes simplex virus infection in, in AIDS is to look for cytomegalovirus. It's, it's, it's remarkable how frequently one sees CMV in these patients and one knows automatically, and certainly in our country, if it's an extensive perineal ulceration or genital ulceration in a patient with AIDS, look for CMV. Another example we see that, that we of dual pathology, this is a case we saw at Johannesburg Hospital towards the end of last year. Verrucous lesions on the lower limbs, the clinician um, thought that this was probably um, verrucous Kaposi sarcoma. I think that was a, a rather good call, but it emphasizes how important it is to do biopsy. On biopsy though, the specimen was crawling with Cryptococcus neoformans organisms. As you see here, confirmed mucicarmine staining, the budding. In the background though, there was a subtle spindle cell proliferation with red cell extravasation confirmed to be HHV8 related. So that was Kaposi sarcoma with, with Cryptococcus neoformans infection. Another example to illustrate how subtle the cryptococcosis can be. This biopsy was, was taken for confirmation of um, early plaque stage Kaposi sarcoma. And incidentally, these organisms caught one's eye on careful inspection of some of the clefts in the dermis, confirmed to be um, cryptococcus with a distinctive mucoid capsule. So sometimes the cryptococci are extremely subtle. And if you make one diagnosis here, namely Kaposi sarcoma, and don't look at the sections very carefully, something like that's terribly easy to, over, to overlook. And that could have devastating consequences for the patient um, because he or she might well present with them um, with cryptococcal meningitis, and that could certainly take their life. So it brings me to the next point. What infections have been reported in association with Kaposi sarcoma? So it's a fairly extensive list. Now, fortunately, this scenario is uncommon. And these are mostly in the form of single case reports in the literature. But all of these organisms have been reported as occurring concomitantly with um, Kaposi sarcoma. So just bear in mind, that KS can harbor other pathology. For example, this case, this gentleman um, underwent biopsy for confirmation of Kaposi sarcoma, and this was a biopsy taken from his face, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, there's clear evidence here of a vasoproliferative process with typical features of Kaposi sarcoma, but something catches one's eye in the lower half of the field is a granuloma. As you can see, that's not caseating, but he was in fact on anti-tuberculous therapy at the time for pulmonary tuberculosis. And although I could not demonstrate acid fast organisms in that, in that granuloma, the PCR was positive and um, he had Kaposi sarcoma and TB. So what does it mean if you see concomitant mycobacterium tuberculosis infection in association with Kaposi sarcoma? Well, obviously, it means that he has systemic tuberculosis. Another thing that could also mean is non-compliance to the anti-tuberculous medication. And then another important aspect which has emerged, certainly in our country in recent years, is multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. So you don't want to miss the granuloma. Um, you might want to alert uh, your clinical colleague to the fact that the Kaposi sarcoma does harbor granulomas. Um, and if the patient's not known to have TB and you see a granuloma in the lesion, it's important to tell the clinician because they probably have underlying pulmonary tuberculosis which hasn't been picked up. Another um, case, one of my favorite um, cases of, that I've seen, and I've shown this at many meetings, and if any of you have seen this, uh, if I've presented at a meeting that, and you've seen this, 
uh, these images before, please forgive me, but I, I think it just illustrates a point rather nicely. This patient had HIV AIDS and um, was found to have um, hemorrhagic looking patches, but also blisters. And the astute dermatologist decided to buy up, take the biopsy uh, on a lesion which looked like a blister on top of a hemorrhagic looking lesion. Um, and uh, I'm so glad that he did because it shows an in interesting combination of pathology. So if we look at the top there, we have the edge of the blister and you can clearly see that there are these intranuclear um, viral inclusion. This was varicella zoster virus infection at the top. And if you look to the level of mid dermis, there's a rip roaring leukocytoclastic vasculitis going on there. And then something catches your eye in the deeper dermis. There's a spindle proliferation with red cell extravasation, some plasma cells, a little bit of hemosiderin pigment, and that's Kaposi sarcoma. So there we have three for the price of one in a single punch biopsy. And there, just if, in case you don't believe me, uh, there we have confirmation of the Kaposi sarcoma in the depths of the biopsy. Another extreme case, um, this was a, a lady in her 40s who was admitted to the Janusburg Hospital, moribund comatose with multiple necrotic ulcerated skin lesions. And on biopsy, there was a really florid vasculitis with dirty necrosis also visible in, in the dermal compartment. And on careful inspection, one clearly saw these very, very prominent virally infected cells and there's evidence of really florid cytomegalovirus infection and that may indeed account for the vasculitis. So there we see the CMV infection. But if you look at this particular field, something else catches your eye. That looks very different to the cytomegalovirus. And there you can see organisms invading the vessel wall and contributing to the vasculitis with uh, the karyorectic debris noted in the background. And on immunohistochemical staining, those are in fact acanth amoeba organisms. Not only that, cultures from the ulcer revealed blastomyces dermatitidis. I wasn't able to see that in the punch biopsy that was sent, but um, it was certainly confirmed on culture. So this patient had necrotizing vasculitis in the presence of not only CMV and acanth amoeba, but also blastomyces infection. And that just illustrates how you can see multiple pathologies in a single specimen. Another lesson that I've learned is that one must remain abreast of the developments in the field of medical microbiology. Um, I'm, I'm a, I can sometimes be quite cynical, but I think the new frontier in microbiology is to rename or rename organisms. And if you're not, you don't keep up with the literature, it's very easy to for, to to overlook ch change, changes in nomenclature. For example, uh, one example would be um, uh, a Penicillium marnefii, uh, which is a, the commonest HIV-associated um, invasive fungal infection in, in parts of the world like Southeast Asia. We don't see that in South Africa, but at recent, it was recently brought to my attention that that organism now has now been re renamed Telaromyces. So even Penicillium has changed. This is something that we've we've started to see or recognize in South Africa. This was a young lady with multiple crusted skin lesions. She also had pulmonary involvement and was rather seriously ill. And there we see her facial skin lesions. And on biopsy, a very busy looking dermis. And why does the dermis look busy? Well, it looks busy because it's full of macrophages. And the macrophages are absolutely packed with fungal organisms as you can see, are these small fungal yeasts. Now, I think you'd be forgiven for saying that that looks remarkably like histoplasma. And in fact, for many years, I think we were calling this histoplasma. Intracellular organisms, as you can see there, confirmed on PAS staining and on Grocot staining. But it's not histoplasma because although the fungal culture was negative, um, PCR revealed that it was uh, Emoncia infection, it was initially labeled Emoncia, a species closely related to Emoncia posteriana, but which has subsequently been renamed Emergomyces africanus. So what that is, is really is Emonciosis. And it's something that many of you may not have heard of, but it's something that we're certainly aware of in, or have been aware of in South Africa in recent years. Um, about 54 cases have been reported from South Africa thus far. The 
overwhelming majority have been HIV positive with low CD4 counts, with only a sm uh, relatively small proportion on antiretroviral therapy, and they all had disseminated um, infection. Skin lesions are almost universal in, in these patients, and they're often widespread, and they're often there for a number of weeks. And sometimes, they, the, this infection can be a form of unmasking uh, 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 iris um, in patients who, who develop the lesions after initiation of antiretroviral therapy. And the spectrum of clinical features is as diverse as one would see in histoplasma capsulatum infection. There can be nodules, crusted plaques, smaller papular lesions, lesions that can look like vasculitis, multiple crusted skin lesions, and these all different patients with varying skin, skin lesions. Sometimes they look vasculitic, ulcerated lesion on the palate, as we see here, crusted lesions on the nose. So the, histo the differential diagnosis would be histoplasma. I would say that the clinical spectrum and in the terms of skin and mucocutaneous involvement is identical. And I would go as far as saying that these two infections are virtually indistinguishable by light microscopy. Now, although it's regarded as an emerging mycosis in South Africa, I really don't believe that it is a truly emerging mic. I think it always has been here. We have always labeled it as histoplasmosis because small intracellular yeast, it looks like histoplasma capsulatum. Um, and um, it's just a definite pitfall. So at the moment, whenever we want are tempted to diagnose histoplasma infection, uh, we hold back and submit the biopsies for, um, for PCR and with um, molecular mycology, they invariably turn out to be in cases of Emergomyces africanus infection. I think the name will probably change from emonciosis to Emergomycosis in years to come, but at the moment it's still called emonciosis. Um, other differential diagnostic considerations, I guess one could think of um, microforms of blastomyces could look similar, I guess. Uh, the condition has a very high mortality, um, almost 50% in our series. Now, patients who are treated with amphotericin B tend to survive. So, seven out of ten patients who are treated with amphotericin B will survive, but if they're only treated with a triazole agent, the, the uh, survival plummets to only 33%. So, that's very important. These lesions have to be treated appropriately with amphotericin. I've alluded to um, immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome briefly as we've gone through the talk. Um, uh, but I think it's important to remember that if you see a, a, a biopsy from a patient with HIV AIDS, ask yourself the question, the condition that I'm seeing on the microscope, could this be a reflection of underlying iris? And just to bear in mind that the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome or iris is two clinical settings, so-called unmasking iris or paradoxical iris. And unmasking iris is where there's worsening of a condition um, in the um, in the presence of a subclinical um, opportunistic inf infective pathogen. Um, and paradoxical is where there's clinical worsening of a previously known treated opportunistic disease, but it flares up when the antiretroviral um, therapy is initiated. And that's why it's paradoxical. Just to illustrate, this is from a colleague in at the University of, KwaZul of KwaZulu-Natal in, in Durban. This, this gentleman presented with these multiple skin lesions very extensive and was found to be HIV positive, placed on antiretroviral therapy. Those lesions were in fact molluscum contagiosum. So after he was in, in antiretroviral therapy was initiated, this is what happened. He developed these really unsightly disfiguring um, skin lesions and that was um, paradoxical molluscum contagiosum iris. His treatment was modified and uh, you can see a dramatic clinical response um, after the iris was managed appropriately. This review article appeared some eight years ago in histopathology, and I think it's still highly relevant. It uh, was the author is uh, my friend and colleague, Pratista Ramdiol, who works at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in, in, in Durban, uh, part of the country where we see the most HIV AIDS. So she has a wealth of experience, and she wrote this superb review article on, um, on HIV AIDS related skin pathology, and I really would recommend it. Um, and one particularly useful table is um, this one, which describes cutaneous manifestations, both infective and non-infective, of the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. 
So although most of them are infective, a number of other uh, conditions can be regarded as iris, including Kaposi sarcoma in, in some cases. And this is that particular um, paper. It was in uh, 2010 in Histopathology and the author, Pratista Ramdiol. And I really would recommend this if you want to do further reading around dermatopathology of HIV AIDS. I, I'm not familiar, I'm not aware of another article that's better than this eight-year-old paper on the topic. So the take-home message is an integrated diagnostic approach is required. And what does that entail? Well, interpretation of the histological pattern in the context of the clinical findings with a high index of suspicion for unusual features if you know that a patient has HIV AIDS. I think if you follow that rule, um, you should be fairly safe. And it goes without saying that clinical pathological correlation is of paramount importance. And something that I sometimes tell our residents is that in our job, the telephone is often more useful than the microscope. Pick up the telephone and commute, uh, communicate with your clinical colleagues and you can get yourself out of trouble very often just by following that, that simple rule. So with that, I'll end and I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, I'd like to just thank uh, Dr. Karai for, for the very kind invitation to be part of this. And I was unaware that this was the first talk from Africa, so I feel very honored to, to be representing my entire continent for the first time. But I hope to do so uh, in the future now that I know how the IT works on this side. And um, thank you for your attention and, uh, and uh, well, till next time. Thank you very much. It was a uh, the force uh, talk on all these, uh, you know, very interesting diseases. I, I just had to kind of, you know, you showed so many things uh, that I was like, wow, you know, I don't even know uh, how you guys are kind of catching all these diagnoses. So thank you very much. It was extremely educational and exactly what I uh, wanted to have, you know, for this talk because uh, we had uh, we really got introduced into the uh, situation and we learned about new uh, diseases and, and problems. So uh, we, we greatly appreciate this talk. Uh, it would be maybe, you know, very interesting uh, follow up also with with clinicians uh, who are working with infectious disease to have a little bit of information about this immune constitution syndrome and what is the management is actually uh, have to do to to change so dramatically you know patients outcome as you as you showed uh, so thank you uh, very much uh, I, I we had a, we had a great time now we have a little bit of time to ask uh, a few question uh, from Dr. Grayson sure. uh, if you guys uh, want to ask uh, this is the opportunity to ask the expert uh, uh, what uh, is is your uh, problem or maybe you have uh, diagnostic questions in the meantime i would like to ask uh, from you that uh, you know you talked about a lot of hiv associated diseases and one of them is syphilis we ran into a tertiary syphilis case a couple of weeks ago and uh, i'm just curious about your take on uh, you know tertiary syphilis neurosyphilis uh, including you know tabes dorsalis including uh, uh, you know uh, uh, dissecting aortic aneurysms uh, do you see that kind of pathology? How is, uh, you know, tertiary syphilis uh, showing itself in, in, in uh, Africa? I have uh, virtually no personal experience. Um, certainly since having left full-time practice at medical school and not being involved in the autopsy service. Um, so I, I think it's certainly something that um, our, our, um, our, our cardio, uh, cardiologists um, call colleagues see. Uh, I, I've, in terms of the skin lesions of, of tertiary syphilis, I, it's not something that I, I tend to see. I, I think I can recall having seen perhaps one gametous lesion, but most of the cases that I see are, are, um, are secondary syphilitic lesion, very exceptionally a primary lesion, um, but I have very limited experience on, on tertiary syphilis in HIV. But one thing that, that um, that, that is taught down here is how HIV in concert with syphilis tends to telescope that natural progression from primary to secondary to tertiary. It seems to just condense it. 
greatly and accelerate um, the the propensity to develop those those complications later, including the cardiovascular complications. But from a personal experience point of view, um, I have almost no experience with tertiary syphilis. I just have to be brutally honest there, Laszlo. I, I see. Uh, the other thing is, you know, that uh, regarding uh, biogenic granulomas associated with Kaposi sarcomas, uh, I see, and I'm just kind of running it by you, you know, if, if you see the same, uh, that a couple of cases, uh, Kaposi sarcoma lesions get irritated and evolve a, a, bi a biogenic granuloma lesion basically on top of uh, the KS. So I had actually two biopsies which were, I mean, the clinician sent this in as pyogenic granuloma, and they were pyogenic wow. granulomas, but basically the pyogenic granuloma was a reactive tissue proliferation, and it was emanated or it was connected uh, below uh, to uh, Kaposi sarcoma-like uh, feeder lesion. I don't know if you see that uh, kind of uh, association or because that's uh, when no, you're... I, ha I haven't. But that sounds fantastic. Uh, I mean, it sounds be like beautiful histology. I, I mean, you see a fair number of of Kaposi sarcoma cases, but I've never seen one something like that. Hmm. Wow! It just shows that every pitfall has a pitfall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was it was uh, very interesting. And when we did, you know, the HHVA staining, it was a beautiful discrepancy between uh, the overlying PG lesion and the underlying. Uh, I mean, uh, HHV8 infected lesion. Yes. Wow. It sounds like something worth publishing. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and then, you know, the other uh, question I would like to ask you that, uh, how do you see uh, endemic Kaposi sarcoma? And uh, because we don't really see those cases, I mean, are, are those increased in frequency due to HIV AIDS or, or not really? I think that that's a very difficult area because uh, you know African endemic Kaposi sarcoma is out there. Um, we, we, the, we, we, it's. I think it's very uncommon in in our part of Africa. And if someone is a, has HIV/AIDS um, and they have Kaposi sarcoma, I think we're automatically going to say that it's HIV/AIDS associated rather than true African endemic Kaposi sarcoma. But I've seen a handful of cases, and uh, you know by definition they would be HIV negative. Um, but I think that's a condition one sees more in a you know, higher up, up you know, north of our borders and not very much of it here. But it does exist, um, but I have very limited experience because 99 out of 100 Kaposi sarcoma cases that cross our, our microscopes here in South Africa are HIV AIDS related. Every now and then there'll be an organ transplant recipient, um, I can recall having seen a liver transplant recipient with KS and um, a renal transplant recipient but the number of African endemic Kaposi sarcoma cases I've seen or even the classical Mediterranean type um, I can count I can count on one or two hands uh, just because of the the prevalence the, the high prevalence of HIV AIDS here so it's, our cases are almost invariably um, AIDS related I see, I see. well then uh, thank you very much uh, that uh, is uh, concluding our meeting for uh, today or tonight. Again, greatly appreciate you coming along and, and giving us this fantastic talk. And we greatly appreciate Thank you that. very much. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we will be able to have this uh, some other time, some other uh, topics uh, later on. Uh, so with all that, uh, thanks for everyone to joining in. And uh, good night to everyone, especially for you, because we are still at, you know, at three o'clock, but uh, it is getting very late. In South Africa. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank bye you, Laz. Thank you very much for the invitation. Bye bye then. Bye Good bye. night. Good night.